just so we can use it as a reference for RAS extension. Um, so thanks all for jumping online to today's meeting. Uh, just quickly, unfortunately, we can't have a face-to-face -face meeting because of COVID, but um, here's a little bit of a quick overview of what we're going to run through. Brian's going to present about a little in, bit of information about last season, the VO71 and some nitrogen management. Malcolm's going to give a weeds update and also a chemical sequence and just what we can use because there's reports of shortages coming up. Uh, Corteva is going to join us. Um, they're going to give us an update about Ubenic and Ajixa. Dave Trolldahl is going to chat about the resources that are available. Mark and Anna Jewell from Grower Services are going to chat about variety, seed, pricing. So if you've got any questions, that would be the time to ask questions of Sunras. And then RAS Extension, um, Troy and I have just got some brief information to share, a bit of a case study of VO71 and water use in the MIL footprint. So I will hand over to Brian to kick things off if you want to start sharing your screen. Thanks, Charlton. And good afternoon, everybody. Just um, I've got a heap of screens here. Can you see that? No, we can still see the internet. Sorry. I'll just shut a few screens down. Yep. How about that one? Yep, there it is. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Should come up full screen in a second. So I'm going to talk about um, agronomy, a bit about the season that we had, which wasn't very joyous for a lot of people. And um, VI71, go through some of our experiments this year and show you what happened and then nitrogen management and a few other things. This graph from Laurie Lewin puts his data out all the time. So it's 10 day monthly mean temperatures. So coming out of Eloquin, I think it's bomb data from the airport. So you can see here um, in November, the temperatures are really quite good. So the red line's 2021, the black line is the 60 year mean. So through tillering there in, in November, we had some really good warm temperatures. But once we hit early December, the temperatures really dropped down. Particularly the minimums, this is um, yeah, some really quite low minimums and we get across here too. Into the critical periods of microspore and flowering, and you know, we, we got some severely low temperatures. So I just pulled up the data from our Bunalu experiment, which is sort of probably the colder part of the region. And you can see once we get we like 15 degrees is getting fairly critical, especially at microspore. So through this period here where a lot of Time we would have had microspore many days below that 15. And then once, once we get past about the 20th of February, it's continuous. So a number of crops, it was really luck of the draw as to when you fit it in here. If you went through microspore in one of these periods here, four or five days of low temperatures, and then hit low temperatures again at flowering is when we got the most significant damage. So looking at um, RISIC phenology overall. So this is from all our experiments across the different sowing methods. We can see that there was a little bit longer from days flush to PI, and that's um, partly that December temperature, but it was greatly extended in the days from PI to flowering. So you see there 35 days. Normally we're working on about 31 in, in average, average years. If we look at, at RISIC across the different sowing methods, um, this is sort of quite valuable. You can see that aerial sown is um, aerial sown, that's sowing date, flowering, sort of 98 days. When we go to drill, you're looking at adding another seven days. And if you're going to delay permanent water on average, you're adding another about 10 days. So that's why we have the, the different um, sowing dates for the different methods. 
So the, the longer what we find with rice is the shorter period that it's ponded, the longer its growth duration. So it grows much quicker and develops much quicker when it's ponded than if it's um, still aerobic. So what that means essentially, and particularly in a year like last year, if you're sowing late, as a number of people did, because water availability was um, allocations were announced late, um, you really don't use delayed permanent water at all. And if you do drill so, um, go to permanent water as early as possible. We're gonna run through some of our experiments. This was just our site at Leeton Field Station this year. We had a drill zone bay, delayed permanent water bay, and then aerobic bay. And we had yeah, like a number of experiments spread across the valleys, as well as those ones at Leeton. You can see here we've got um, experiments at Mayrung, Aerial Zone, Bunaloo Drill Zone, and a couple of, a rapple of drill and DPW with several varieties which um, cover the Murray Valley. This is um, the Aerial Zone experiment at Mayrung. So basically this year a lot of our experiments were trying to really see how VO71 went compared to Rizik and Sherpa. And there's another variety there, VO37, which we've been looking at for the last couple of years, um, seeing what potential it has. It's a, a very cold, cold tolerant variety, but so far it's not meeting up to the growing quality expectations. So we have those four varieties across five nitrogen rates. So you'll see this quite a bit. So the nitrogen rates are kgs of urea, urea per hectare. The first number, as I say otherwise, is urea pre-permanent water, dash and then the second number is the PI. You can see there we've got a zero which we always have so we can measure nitrogen use efficiency and then a number of permanent water rates and then a split with a, a top dressing at PI. So from the Mayrung stuff you can see that the VO71 and Sherpa both yielded very similarly. Um, back up here about the top yields are about 14 tonne and once you're getting up at these levels you we generally find that um, yield starts to plateau out with increased nitrogen. And these differences here at this level wouldn't be, wouldn't be significant. I don't have the LSD on this graph because I'm not working at the office at the moment. Um, yeah, but you can see VO71's done really well and, and both Sherpa and VO71 have done it a bit better than, than RISIC. We had, at Rappel, we had a drill zone experiment. So, um, uh, ben sowed our experiment at Rappel on a number of our district trials as well and harvested some of our district trials. So um, Ben Hoslip's done a tremendous job in helping us out. You can see on the left is the photo. So it's the two sowing dates. So we had 13 varieties. So we've actually tried to incorporate all varieties to really test what the sh how the short season varieties relate to yield of the longer season varieties. You need to sow them at separate sowing times in the same experiment. So you can see here on the left, you've got the main varieties are all establishing and then there's gaps there apart from the weeds where the VN, the red varieties here um, will be sown. Because we had so many varieties, we just had the two nitrogen rates to try and accommodate the varieties. So in this experiment, you can see that even though VN was sown in optimal time, so the main varieties, were all sown 21st of October, first flush. And these three varieties on the end here were sown first flush to 22nd of November. And permanent water happened on the 16th of December. So reasonably, you can say that all these, all these first varieties were all made permanent water. And these three varieties were later sown would drill. So achieving here yields of the end of 10 to 12 tonne, but they were far surpassed by the yields of Sherpa and BA71 back up here at 14 to 15 tonne. And then you can see the different varieties as, uh, as, we, um, as we go through. Even Koshi, um, you can see he's yielding at the lower nitrogen rates, yielding up above 11 tonne, which it has the potential to do, um, but it tends to fall over at that level. The experiment at Bunaloo was particularly relevant this year. Um, it had the four varieties, the same as the aerial zone experiment. This was drill and those five nitrogen rates. You can see here a little bit of haying off in this experiment. Um, just ran out of water at the end, but it didn't really impact yields. But what you can see when you look at the results from the bundle of so it was first flush on the 15th of October, permanent water the 28th of November. 
So I think realistically, the grower would have liked permanent water a bit earlier, but he had a shower of rain and pushed things off four or five days. You can see that Sherpa and VA71 have yielded really well and pretty level across all nitrogen rates. So it's obviously a high nitrogen site because the zeros here in the blue are yielding 12 tonne. Um, so all the Sherpas are yielding between 12 and 14 tonne and VO37 is virtually the same. And if you look at that graph, at that graph, you'd say, well, obviously Rizik and VO37 are less cold tolerant, hammered by the cold, and, and that's what happened. In actual fact, Rizik's least cold tolerant, but VO37 is the most cold tolerant of all these varieties. And Sherpa and, and VO 71 are um, fairly similar. So it's not actually um, the rate of nitrogen or the tolerance of the variety to cold that's having the impact here. It's the timing of when these varieties went through microspore and flowering. So these are the flowering dates for the different varieties. So you can see the impact of adding nitrogen um, is back to development, slows the development as it normally happens. But you can see here there's a good weak difference between when VO71 and Sherpa, there's a good weak difference between when they went through um, flowering and obviously microspore and when 37 and Rizik went through. So I guess the, the bottom line here is that um, a, a lot of the, there's been a lot of discussion I've heard amongst growers this year about you know, their high nitrogen rates um, creating the problems with the cold sterility. But in fact, the biggest problem is not so much nitrogen, the biggest problem has been the actual, the timing of microspore and flowering and how they lined up with the cold events. And if we put all the data together from all the experiments from the, this season, so it's a mid flowering date versus grain yield, you can see there's a, you know, sort of a plateau and then it drops down Ones on the left here are experiments up at Wajeli and that really high yielding soil. And it's a general plateau here, and then it starts to drop off. And if we overlay the recommended mid flowering window on that, you can see that it's sort of pretty much in the plateau. But once you get to the edge of that window in this season, the yield really, really dropped off, which is sort of highlighting the importance of um, sowing in the window, particularly in, in the last season. So the main points from last season is that um, it happened last season, also the season before Rizik, the cool temperatures really extended the growth duration of Rizik, which has pushed it into, a, into the colder window, particularly this season. And the later sowing crops were hit by cold at microspore. And in the worst situation, they actually got double whammy. They got cold at microspore and at flowering. So, you know, creating really large productions in grain yield. And it's really important that, to notice that the timing of the microspore and flowering was a lot more important than nitrogen rate on the sterility. So I guess learnings from the season were sowing the recommended window for the variety and sowing method. If you are sowing late and you drill sowing, do not use delayed permanent water because it will further delay the crop and go to permanent water as early as possible. And if you do get in that situation, if the grower gets in a situation where he is going to sow late, um, it really is worth considering just reducing that pre permanent water nitrogen rate by a bit to help um, stop the delay of development and um, hopefully get a reasonable yield. It could be a yield reduction by doing that. It's probably worth, worth that risk. But probably the big thing that's most important in the season going forward is you'll probably find a number of growers will say, well, I'm going to reduce my pre permanent water nitrogen rate this year because I got hit with cold last year. And if they do that, in a lot of cases, they'll actually reduce their, their grain yield because you can't make up for it later on, which I'll discuss further. So it's probably a really important thing you need to discuss with the growers. The nitrogen management. So our team um, hand applying some nitrogen to the aerobic plot. As most of you would be aware, there is actually no soil nitrogen test for rice. And that makes it really difficult when you're trying to give, you know, recommendations of how much nitrogen to put on pre-permanent water. 
because the variability between different soil types, between fields, and even within fields, the variability of soil nitrogen levels. So the deep soil nitrogen test that's used for wheat and winter cereals, some of the non-rice crops is a nitrate test. When you flood rice, it goes to permanent water, it becomes aerobic, but the nitrate is lost as a gas. But any nitrates in the soil is lost. So the, the rice crop relies on nitrogen that's mineralised during the growing season. Uh, it's generally in the ammonium form. So if you plan to, um, if you haven't got a lot of experience with rice and you, if you plan to use a soil nitrogen test, it, it's not going to be of any benefit to you. So I've pulled together here the, the last six years of data for RISIC. So the amount of urea we applied pre-permanent water versus the grain yield. And I separated out, so the green are the pots just from this season. So you can see some low ones, some low ones at the bottom here, and these are from that Bunalu experiment. So the high, high nitrogen rate you know, gave lower yield, even the lower nitrogen rate gave a really low yield in the same here. But the general trend, when you've got this much data across many fields and um, many seasons, you can start to get good general trends. And what, and what we find is that basically, you know, most fields haven't got a history of legumes, which there probably are some in the Murray Valley, very few up here in the north, but there may be some fields in the Murray Valley that have legume history, which would have to reduce your pre-permanent water nitrogen rate. But most fields are going to be needing for the semi-dwarf variety somewhere in the range of 250 to 300 kgs of urea pre-permanent water to be sufficient to reach the yield potential needed by PI. We're talking about the varieties like uh, Rizik, Sherpa, Opus and, and VO71. So crop soils would generally need something like 260 kgs urea per hectare. If it's a soil that you've grown a bit of rice in and like last year it needed extra nitrogen at PI, you might be pushing up to 320. And some of the really hungry heavy clay soils or heavy cut areas, you could be pushing it up towards the 400 kgs urea per hectare. But it's also really important to address the low, low yielding areas in the field with extra nitrogen pre permanent water. Because you can't, there's only limited can be made up at PI. So you really need to address those early. The other thing that's really important is that um, there's differences in nitrogen efficiency for different sowing irrigation methods. So if you're aerial sowing, the most efficient way to apply your fertilizers, drill it into the soil, it's like something like seven to 10 centimetres deep, uh, prior to putting the water on and then sowing. And that's generally in the range of 40 to 60% nitrogen efficiency. The reason it's only at that level is because it's a long time before the plant actually grows, develops, grows, establishes roots before it can utilize that nitrogen. And so it's, it's left there, even though it attaches to the clay particles, there's more opportunity for it to be lost before the plant can use it. With a conventional drill, where you're applying the urea to a dry soil before permanent water, so three to four leaf stage. Um, the important thing here is the soil has to be dry. If the soil's not dry, when you put your permanent water on, the urea will just stay in the water and will volatilise and you'll get big losses. So dry soil, 50 to 70%. Delayed permanent water is even more efficient because it's, it's like the picture on the right. Um, the crop is well established. It's got a well established root system. It picks up that nitrogen pretty well straight away and pretty well grows exponentially. It takes off once it's, um, so it's more efficient. Probably the important thing here to note agronomically is if you've got a grower that's been aerial sowing and using a standard rate of nitrogen, the same sort of fields, if he's going to drill sowing and delay permanent water, you might have to reduce that rate. Otherwise, he'll be um, pushing it too far. For anybody that's been doing delayed permanent water, there's been quite a bit of talk about, as there always is about, oh, you know, we can't make it through to permanent water without some nitrogen. It really needs some at PI. So we've done multiple experiments over the years on this, but we did another one, another one last year. And you can see here, so the first number in this graph is nitrogen applied urea applied at tillering. And the second number is urea applied pre-permanent water. So you can see here when you split, have a split with 130 applied um, at tillering, excuse me, 
and um, and 260 pre-permanent water compared to all of it being applied pre-permanent water, there's actually no difference in yield. And that's what we consistently find um, with slow permanent water. But in saying that, you know, if there's variability in your field and imagery is showing that some areas are poor growth, you would definitely apply urea to those areas mid tillering to bring them up to even the field up. Brian, just quickly, can you just explain what the definition of delayed permanent water is? Okay, so delayed permanent water is um, drill sowing, but you're not putting the permanent water on at the normal three to four leaf stage. You're putting it on somewhere towards Christmas. So I don't have a I don't have a defined time for when you should be applying your water for delayed permanent water. Like if you start to get a weed problem, you might put it on earlier, but, but you really have to have it on before, around Christmas. So it's got time to take up the nitrogen and settle down before PI. So I sort of, um, going through our experiments, I, I generally have sort of settled that I'll say it's delayed permanent water if there's more than 50 days between first flush and permanent water. That's only an arbitrary value that um, that, I, that I've sort of applied to our experiments. But pretty much it's when you're putting permanent water on later than you would normally would for a conventional drill crop. Is that okay, Joel? Yeah, thanks, Brian. No problem. Um, so this graph's pretty important. So it's from our experiments two years ago and at um, the varieties were Rizic, Opus and Lange. So what it shows us, and we have had similar results from earlier experiments as well. Um, so we established these different levels here of nitrogen uptake at PI by putting different nitrogen rates on. So it's actually an experiment we use for remote sensing. And then across those different nitrogen rates, we applied three rates of nitrogen or urea at PI. So the red line is zero, the green line is 130 kgs of urea per hectare and the purple line is 260. So what it's showing us is when you've got a low nitrogen uptake, so, so realistically in most situations, you really want a nitrogen uptake of 100 or 120 for semi dwarf varieties at PI. When you're lower than that, you know, adding 130 kgs per hectare of urea will increase yield, but it won't increase it to the level that would be the potential of, of that crop. So, so what it's showing us, and even putting on 260 kgs here at the 94, so pretty much when you're getting below nitrogen uptake, I'll put here at the 94, but pretty much below 100, when you're getting nitrogen uptake of PI below 100, you've already lost some yield potential. So it's explaining, even though there's a, there's a risk of, of more coal damage by um, putting excess nitrogen at pre-permanent water, if you don't put enough, you're not going to reach the yield potential. Got a couple of graphs here um, from Josh Hart has done some work on the enhanced efficiency slow release fertilizers. And um, so he's done four experiments over the last couple of years as part of our project. And this one's an experiment that he did at Leap Farm this year. So on Koshi, we sort of moved to Koshi because we thought um, it's the best opportunity where it might give a high yield and, and reduce lodging. So what you can see is uh, the standard zero. Um, the first number, so this is urea. The first number is applied at sowing with the seed. Second number is pre-permanent water. And the third number is PI. So all these different forms of um, enhanced efficiency fertilizers here, they all had 100 kgs of N at sowing with the seed. And then we have the urea. So this, this had urea with the seed and this had urea standard recommended method at um, pre-permanent water drill sown experiment. What you can see firstly is that if you put urea with the seed, you get benefit from it over the zero, but the event benefit is, is significantly less than if you put it on pre-permanent water. And that's because of the flushing as it goes through the wetting and drying cycles, you get nitrification, denitrification, so it's building up nitrate, which when it's flooded, the nitrate's then lost. So you're losing nitrogen and you're getting lower yield. 
But if you look at all of these, all of these different fertilizers here, nothing actually produced a yield better than just applying urea in our recommended practice. And if we look at um, Josh's data for the four experiments, you can see that um, the same thing happened for, you know, in pretty much in all experiments. We never found a yield or nitrogen use efficiency advantage using slow release fertilizer. So this is the average of all the different treatments. So the standard urea, pre-permanent water was equal highest yield to anything else. In three of, the, three of the four experiments, it was a fairly low soil nitrogen levels. And you can see a visual response from those fertilizers, but it never actually showed a yield response. So Josh's conclusion from, from, the, from this work is that Realistically, it's good economic and agronomic sense to just use standard urea at the recommend, recommended period. So for drill sowing, it's pre-permanent water. You get equal yield and it's much cheaper than um, using some of these fertilizers. I guess a big question in the next month for most of you agronomists, the um, growers will be asking, what variety should I grow? Um, particularly as they give different prices. I'm not sure, like, um, I know up north, Mark will talk about it later. I know up north that there's a bonuses for Langi and Topaz. So they've got to weigh up whether that's worthwhile or not. Down south, whether there'll be um, different prices for, for um, which I assume there will be for Koshi, but, but different things. And the best way to, um, best information realistically is to get the rice variety guide, which compares all, all varieties. Then once you do that and they've determined a variety, actually get the actual growing guide for that variety. So we have a growing guide for every individual variety. So in the rice growing guide, it'll have this table for Murray Valley, which so shows the yield from all our experiments over the last seven years. It shows here how many experiments are actually conducted in that and the, the grain yield relative to RISIC. It sort of shows the variability it gives you a general idea of how that variety yields compared to the standard RISIC. So you can see here with Koshi, it's basically 89% on average. Some years in our experiments have been up to 94%, other years lower. It just gives you a general idea of what the, the yield might be. And then we have the viral varietal characteristics table, which probably the big ones here are um, particularly cold tolerance. You know, how that variety relates. So if you're looking at something like Topaz and Dingara, they're really cold sensitive. You need to take that into account. And Koshi, you take lodging into account, serious lodging problems. Also, the end has a, you know, bit of a lodging potential. It's worthwhile going through the table and identifying um, what variety is best for their situation. And then there's all the recommended sowing dates for the different valleys and, and methods. <coughs> But realistically, once, once they've determined the variety, they're better off to go to the growing guide. And in each growing guide, it has this figure that um, Tanner and I put together last year for the growing guide. So for every variety, it has this figure of when to sow that variety for the different regions and the different method. On the right here, it's basically the reason why that is the recommended sowing window. So the hatched area is the period of least probability of low temperatures. So from 70 years worth of data, this is a period where you have, in most cases, warm temperatures. So that's where you want your most critical period. That's where you want your microspore and your flowering. So because of that, microspore, the recommended periods, 21st, 31st of January, flowering, first half of February, that's putting PI in this period, the first two weeks of January. When, so to line up with those, you, you come back to the sowing window. So aerial sowing, pondered for the whole time, it grows much quicker, it's sown latest. And we go to drill sowing and delayed permanent water. So we've moved down to the Murray Valley, it's a little bit cooler than up north, so sowing is a little bit earlier um, for, all, for all of these. We actually have changed the RISIC sowing recommendation a little bit this year. We bought the aerial sown uh, RISIC thing forward five days. 
and the end date for delayed permanent water. So if you're pushing it out to, right to Christmas or a bit later, um, you really need to stop sowing that by mid-October or you're going to be running late. So they're the two changes um, of this year, the RISIC recommendation. VO71 is virtually um, the same sowing dates because VO71 is very similar in growth duration to RISIC. The only change we have on RISIC for it is in the MIA, we, we bought the window forward five days for aerial. And in a normal season, a normal warm season, you'll find that VO71 will be a couple of days longer to flowering than RISIC. Um, but the last two seasons that have been cold, RISIC has been extended and, and is coming in earlier. I'll just go through VO71 now. So we've had it in our experiments for two years. Um, so several experiments across the valleys and sowing methods. In every experiment in the, in the district, we've always got a higher grain yield from VO71 than we have from RISIC. Um, RISIC ha uh, VO71 has superior cold tolerance to RISIC. So we, in our experiments, we can't measure cold, but from research that Jackie Mitchell does from University of Queensland, where they do a lot of the cold work and also Peter Snell's work for the breeder on cold, they're telling me that the cold tolerance of VO71 is a lot better than RISIC and similar to Sherpa. Tina and I have done quite a lot of work on grain shattering the last couple of seasons, measuring the shattering of all varieties. So, you know, RISIC is our, our basically our worst shattering variety, and or Koshi is our best shattering, like it's nearly impossible to beat off the plant. But um, VO71 is quite a bit better, so less shattering than RISIC, and it's very similar to Sherpa. And has also done a lot of work on establishment vigour the last two seasons, you know, directly comparing varieties. And RISIC always comes out as our, our most um, variety with our high establishment vigour, and um, VO71 has been equal to that. We're putting lodging resistance of VO71 as being similar to RISIC. We have no reason to believe it's not, but the last two seasons haven't been seasons that have been prone to lodging. So they haven't been really hot seasons where it's grown and fallen over badly. So that'll really be tested in a, in a really warm season. But from the information we've got so far, we think it's similar lodging resistance to RISIC. Probably one of the, so they're all significant advantages, but probably one of the, Biggest advantage, particularly in the in the last season, is that um, VO71 is photoperiod sensitive, so it doesn't slow down in its growth like RISIC does in the cool years, and that's been a big benefit this year. In our experiments, we've shown them at the same time RISIC has slowed down and taken much longer to get through the the, the reproductive periods and has been hit by cold, whereas VO71 has kept developing and hasn't had that problem. So it's a a really significant benefit of VO71. So from all the work we've done, I, I haven't at this stage found any negatives for VO71. Everything I've found is at least as good as RISIC and in most cases um, better. So these are the experiments in the district with direct comparison of RISIC and VO71. You can see up north, there's often not a really big advantage out of um, VO71, but it's always better than RISIC. Particularly down here in the Murray Valley, it's consistently, you know, a couple of tonne better. And down at Bunaloo, where the, you know, RISIC got extended out a week or more later, and got hit really severely, looking at over five to six tonne better. So what about nitrogen management, 71? This graph just shows um, the data from all of our experiments over the last two seasons. So the, the rate of pre-permanent water urea um, compared to the grain yield achieved. So this is a pretty standard graph we get for our semi-dwarf. So we get an increase in grain yield uh, up until the nitrogen level where it plateaus. And then at some extent it either starts to decline due to cold or get serious lodging. Um, so pretty much here, so what the target, because of the variability, we sort of tend to target at the beginning of the plateau as being an area where you should be fairly close to the amount of nitrogen you require pre-permanent water 
it, not be taking a big risk um, that you're pushing it out the top end too far. There's a bit of bit of movement there if, if you do get it wrong. So you're looking at that 300 kgs of urea per hectare as being like a general recommendation. Those who went to the field day last year at Rappel, this was for the experiment that I was standing in front of at one stage, um, where we had VO71 by several nitrogen rates and different times. So these are just a couple of plots, um, 200 kgs of urea per permanent water, nothing at PI, 300 per permanent water and 400 per permanent water. So you can just see the increased um, density there and the more leaf above the panicles and more delay here. But if you want to actually look at the yields, so this is the yields from that experiment. And um, so the first number is permanent water urea, the second number is PI urea. So you can see here is 200 of urea per permanent water. We add another 100 at PI, increases yield a little bit. Add another 200 and increases yield a little bit more. But not enough, not as much as what we got by applying 300 pre permanent water. So even applying 300 here as a 200-100 split is yielding quite a bit less than, than that 300. So just sort of, it's another example of, of showing the same thing applies in VO71. If you don't get enough fertiliser pre permanent water and build enough growth, you're not going to make maximum potential yield by applying it at PI. Sowing rates. We've brought sowing rates down a little bit this year, mainly because you know we've kept them at quite a high level for a few seasons now, higher than what we really think they should be. And um, particularly, um, drill sowers now are starting to um, to really get better equipment, get really good seed placement, two to three centimeters depth, good layouts, and you know they're starting to um, work the system out. And you don't need you don't need 150 kgs of um, of seed for these varieties. So VO71 is a slightly smaller seed than Rizik. Um, it's in the same group. Topaz is a fair bit smaller seed, but it, um, it's a really poor establisher, so it's it's in that group. And if you put these um, rates on, you know, in normal situation, you'll be pushing up towards 200 plants a square metre. So if things aren't quite as good, you're still in this range of 100. 200 plants. Probably one of the big things we're really we're really pushing at the moment um, to maximise grain yield and water productivity is reducing the variability in the field. So trying to make mac because the water is going to be water use is going to be the same across that field regardless if that patch is yielding six ton or whether it's yielding ten ton. To improve water productivity, we've got, the, got to get the six tonne patch yielding 10 tonne as well. You can see here, um, one of the big issues that's come out the last two or three seasons, particularly in the north where people have really gone to spreaders for um, putting their fertiliser on, there's a lot of striping. So um, a lot of growers are actually inducing variability in their field, which is something we really you know, want to move away from. We're trying to you know, in, reduce the variability and not increase it. The major variability in the field due, due to different soil types or cut and fill and things like that really has to be addressed early, so pre-permanant water, because it's too late. As, as I showed you in that graph earlier, the amount of yield you can increase by applying PI nitrogen is too late by PI to correct major deficiencies. And it's really only a top up. So you really need to, to look at picking those areas up early. And if you... Um, if you haven't got it all pre-permanent water, then there is an opportunity to look at some mid-tillering options just to pick up those poor areas. I'm not um, recommending mid-tillering nitrogen top dressing as general field practice because it's not very efficient. I am recommending it as an opportunity if you can identify areas in the field that have low growth, um, but it's an opportunity there to pick them up before you get to the AI. This is just an example of a field from two years ago. So NWI imagery is quite good up until, you know, the, the first week, 10th of December. Once you get past about the 15th of December, you'll find that NDVI imagery will, it'll saturate. The crop growth gets too big and it can't pick any differences up. So you really need to, to be using it 
in um, late November, early December. And then you can pick up differences. And if you go and ground truth the areas, work out if it's actually plant growth that's the difference, not poor establishment or weeds, and there's an opportunity to pick those poor areas up with some urea, probably before about the 10th of December. So it's got time to pick that urea up um, and grow before you get to PI when you can have another assessment of, um, of what's going on. If you've got low plant populations, there's no need or no point in applying extra nitrogen because the plants already get a lot more nitrogen because there's a lot less plants. So the data has shown that the nitrogen percentage in low establishments is much higher than um, normal. So last season- It's uh, Troy here. There is, a, there is a question in the chat box from Greg Sefton. It was a couple of slides ago, so I'm not sure if you want to wait to the end to answer it or um, do it now. I can hit me now, Troy. I just can't Brian see the chat box. Yeah. yeah, okay. It says, Brian, 400 kilos uh, looks better, less spread of data on the graph, tighter spread of sample points. Can you comment comment on that, please? Uh, that was from Greg Sefton. So there was a couple of slides back. Uh, there is a, a lot of fields that will um, need 400. And if you, if you knew, if you knew that, that that field actually needed it, I wouldn't have a problem of putting that on. Um, but the problem is if, if you're putting 400 on, you run the risk in some fields that it might be excess and you're pushing yourself into the higher risk of cold or severe lodging. So I think that's, you know, I'm happy for people. We put 400 on at Leeton Farm on the self-mulching clay and we've never had a problem with that. Um, but you know, there'll be some fields that might be a problem. So I think that comes back to the grower and the agronomist knowing their fields and knowing that it can handle that amount. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, so remote sensing. So last year we we worked, collaborated with Sunrise and um, we paid, or Sunrise paid for the majority, we paid for some imagery from Ceres imaging. So 10,000 hectares of rice was imaged over the PI period for the NDRE. And then we sampled our experiments and built the algorithms, which then um, could calculate nitrogen uptake or predict nitrogen uptake from the NDRE and produce nitrogen top dressing maps. So this was done, the system was set up with um, James Brinkhoff at UNE. He's a major collaborator in this remote sensing work also working with Rob Walsh at Sunrise. system was set up to do this so we could bring the images in, apply the algorithm uh, and get the maps. And it worked really quite well, but for some fields, the predictions were wrong. And that meant that the nitrogen top dressing, top dressing rates were wrong. And when we looked back through this, we identified that the variability was in the imagery we're getting from Ceres. So the imagery, even in the same flight, different fields would have a different NDRE um, than what was actually there. And the time of the day had a difference and the flight had a difference. So this variability between the NDRE values between the images was creating a variability which um, we weren't happy to accept. We couldn't recommend it to growers at that variability. So what we had quite a bit of discussion on different options of how to overcome this problem. And realistically, the only way to do that would be to um, get growers or agronomists to sample the paddocks. So identify specific sampling points, collect samples, send them in, process them, and then realign the paddock. We know that um, this is not a desirable option for growers or agronomists. And so we've decided not to go down that track and we won't be using Ceres imagery in the coming season um, for this reason. So where are we going with remote sensing? So I know that AgriFutures have um, recently approved a couple of new projects for remote sensing, um, looking at a number of different things. And I think Mark Grote or Anna will talk a little bit about where that's going and in map price and relates to our project as well. And there could be some opportunities to NDVI imagery to be delivered to growers directly um, from emails. And that's fine up until about mid-December. We're looking at an experimental satellite imagery that provides NDRE daily 
on uh, three megapixels. So the preliminary work James has done on this is showing it's really reliable and repeatable. Um, but we, we're having trouble, as is the experimental satellite, we're still trying to build a relationship that we can buy imagery and, and test its prediction ability and repeatability in the coming season. So really for where we are at the PI stuff, it's still um, watch this space. And as, as we um, get access to the new imagery, we'll, we'll let you know where we're up to and what options are available. But I wouldn't, even this season, if it does happen, it won't be fully available to everybody. Um, it would probably be a, a subset, um, which say growers to opt in if they're interested and just as a testing thing to see its accuracy. So we're quite disappointed that, um, you know, we've been working on this remote sensing for quite a while, but we just can't get this number of different satellites and different sources of imagery, but getting something that's repeatable and reliable that you can make an accurate prediction of is really, really, really difficult. So. And David will probably talk about this a little bit, but in DPI, we've got um, we've got the rice variety guide, which I talked about earlier, which I really recommend if you don't have it, just Google um, New South Wales DPI and rice variety guide and it'll pop up and definitely use it to talk to your growers about what variety they should grow. And once they've decided on varieties, every variety has an individual growing guide, which has a lot more detail, has the figure about sowing, sowing dates and also it has um, information, more relevant information about potential nitrogen for that specific variety. And then there's a heap of resources about like plant population and lodging, straight head, PI identification, water depth, many resources there. If, you, if you're not really experienced as a problem with rice, I'd highly recommend you have a, have a look. In summary, um, basic, basic stuff. So on time for the variety method, it really reduces the cold risk. And, and that was really shown this year. It really did, um, very important. 100 to 200 plants a square metre. Realistically, you can get down to 40 and 50 at a, at a crunch and it'll still give you a good yield potential above 10 tonne. But you really like to be above 100. Make sure you're applying sufficient nitrogen pre-permanent water because you can't make it all up at PI. So you'll lose your potential if you don't apply enough. It's really important to maximise water productivity, which is really the battle we're in with rice growing at the moment. Competing water is such an expensive resource. We've got to maximise water productivity. And a major way of doing that is making sure that every part of the field uh, maximises grain yield. Because it's going to use the same amount of water, whether it yields six or 10 tonne. So um, address the field variability early. So preferably pre-permanent water, if you can't get it, then get some NDVI imagery early December and um, just make sure that early imagery isn't influenced by um, water depth. So when the plants are small, deep water will make it look like there's um, not much growth there. Use that imagery to check um, options and that's about it for me. So um, thank you. I'll just have a look at the chat and see if there's any other questions. Thanks, Brian. There's just a Question from Chris Clerk. He just wanted to know if you can define what you mean by first flush date. Okay, so first flush date. I think um, the best way when we're talking about dates, because we, when we've got plots, it's really quite easy to um, for us because we know that actual plot was flushed on this day. But I think for a field, what we really should be talking about is when the middle of that field was flushed. Because you can't, if you just go on, you know, the first flush date, so it's the, the date that the rice had its first irrigation after being sown. If you use the date that is the, um, the top bay, it might be a week or 10 days before you get to the bottom bay. So I think it's, for all of these sort of phenology measurements, it's best to work off the middle of the field. And first flush is, um, yeah, the date that it's got its first flush. So when it will start germination. Right, sorry, Charlie, if, if I could just uh, make the comment, I'll get you to comment. That table you have in the growing guide, uh, you know, we're planting and your relationship then to PI and, um, uh, you know, microspore and, and flowering. Yep. Um, 
so last year, you know, the late crop suffered and and um, and there was a, you know, some fell off a cliff, particularly the real late crops, particularly in the south where it was hit by cold fairly well. There's a fair bit of talk going on of planting early from a grow point of view uh, or earlier. What's, um, what's your comment on that given last year's experience and, and based on, you know, the uh, data behind that table? If you, if you plant too early, um, like I don't have the graph there, but if, if you look at the temperatures, you can get some really cold temperatures um, in January as well, early January. So you start, if you plant too early, you're sort of running into that risk of cold as well. So, so I'm quite happy for you to plant at the beginning of the window or if you must, you've got a lot to do five days earlier. But if you're going to plant, you know, a week or two earlier in the window, you're going to be running into PI in 20th of December. And we still do get a number of cold events in late December, early January, which can knock you around. So... Yeah, I definitely wouldn't be going too far forward of the window. Um, every year is different. Like like those um, those temperatures are only an average over 50 or 60 years. You know, so you can get a cold event at any time. But the the, the period of least of you know highest probability of of reduced cold is in that end of January, early February. So you're sort of trying to trying to hit that. So yeah, yep. I prefer to go too early. And just to add to that, the you know, invariably this year, the, the best yields were the PI dates in that first two weeks of January, regardless of the planting date. Um, and certainly in the last, I don't know, five years that I've been doing the benchmarking side, that, that's, the, that's hit the mark every time. So, um, yeah, is that PI date? I think it's the most, it's, it's the least risk. It's the biggest chance of getting, biggest chance of... Um, of getting a high yield is yeah in that period and it's all about probability yep thanks mark no idea. thanks brian all righty malcolm i'll hand over to you so you can chat about weeds thanks charlie um thank you everybody for your time and uh, an opportunity to venture into your front rooms or offices, as the case may be. I guess we're one day closer to getting out of jail. Uh, what I want to talk to you today uh, will be some broader aspects of rice weed control. Uh, we'll narrow down to some present day issues and hopefully that will be useful to you. First point I'd make is uh, there's nothing conceptual about herbicide resistance in rice. We have lost one very effective mode of action in the form of Londax, uh, and that's a salutary lesson in how not to do things. So that is why we recommend multiple modes of action where possible, where achievable. Uh, we don't wish to see the same programs year on year. And of course, the younger weeds are more susceptible, so you're going to get a better result. And so you have less selection pressure for metabolic resistance by doing that. So uh, that's our, uh, the basis upon which we design some programs. Uh, a topical at the moment is what herbicides have preceded a rice crop. Uh, many of you would have seen this experiment last summer. Uh, there's some plots there that have been treated with Secura back in winter and the effect on the subsequent rice crop. So I have talked about that in previous uh, uh, meetings. Uh, you can distill it down to a couple of group Ks and a couple of group Bs there. So Spinnaker and Intercept are the Immies. Uh, Secure and Butazan are both um, group Ks and uh, there is a new successor to Secura which is called Matino Complete, and it will also have the same amount of the same active ingredient as Secura. So it will also have a warning not to sow rice in the same year after the use of Secura or, or Matino. So beware of fields that have been treated with those products in this winter. Uh, and similarly, be cautious about the triazines that might have been used on canola crops 
uh, and low grain glean particularly on any alkaline source because their uh, breakdown will be inhibited under alkaline conditions. So those are spelt out in the rice crop protection guide uh, to the best of our limited knowledge on them, but um, those trends have been consistent now across two seasons. Uh, there are things that you can and ought to be doing now with your clients to uh, focus in on impacts when setting up fields. So for water seeded crops, uh, the speed at which you fill up will determine the synchrony between the weed development and the rice. So we don't want to let that string out, blow out. Similarly, uh, we want water to stay where it's put. So having integrity in your banks is important. And particularly for drill sown crops, the speed at which you can get water off the field is important because that will uh, influence, <coughs> excuse me, the traffic and ability of the field subsequently. So those are things to be thinking about now. Uh, and similarly, once the field has been prepared with urea underneath, uh, having the clods broken down will assist in filling the field with less water. So that's a critical of critical importance. Can be done with various manners. This is a particularly sophisticated machine in California, but it's still just doing a very basic job, which is to leave the field flat. Um, so we just dealt with that. And the other one, of course, is to make sure the seed bed is clean. So a knockdown of typically glyphosate is a very cheap and very effective treatment to take out early germinating barnyard grass. And barnyard grass will start to germinate late this month or early September, um, depending on temperatures. There's certainly plenty of moisture around to bring that on. And those weeds, if they survive transplanting through the uh, uh, field preparation or sowing, uh, they will be the ones that come to bite us on the ass because they'll be too big. You'll need lots of herbicide and you may not have that herbicide available this year. So we'll talk about that in a bit. So that's a critical thing, having a clean seed bed when you get ready to start flooding a field or seeding it by drill sowing. So a cheap knockdown there. Um, let's put some figures on things. If you want the synchrony of development in the block, you really don't want fields that take 10 and 13 days to fill up. You'll end up with advanced weeds in the first field bays and uh, very young rice in the last field bay. So it doesn't pull a, a small weeds. Weed. So it makes sense to do that quickly, as quickly as possible. And if it starts stretching out, you may want to look at splitting the sowings. Uh, and bloodworms are particularly voracious in the first few days after sowing when the radical comes out of the seed. Uh, one little nibble and the seed is stuck. So uh, having bloodworm treatments there on time and typically applied with a herbicide as a free run uh, is important to get a good plant stand. Uh, I happen to believe that dry broadcast seeding of rice is world's worst practice in rice production. Uh, you may differ, but certainly pre-germinated rice, when the chips are down and the soil type is difficult, pre-germination assists you a lot to get a plant stand. Uh, and the earliest grass weeds are the most competitive uh, and they're the most costly to get rid of. Now, within water seeded rice blocks, we know that the weeds will be most prominent uh, on the high sides of the bays where clods get exposed, herbicides volatilize, and weeds happily germinate there. So, there is an ability within the layout to vary the dose rates. Uh, you'll naturally get some accumulation in lower bays. We don't want to see that in an extreme, so the manner in which the field's laid out and the water enter, enters the field is important in understanding the likelihood that you might get a concentration in the low, lower parts of the field. So uh, you have the opportunity to focus how you deliver that 
lab herbicide treatment. Uh, bikes can do it, aircraft can do it, but also the timing, because the important thing here is an effective dose. And that will depend on how much you deliver, but also how much you retain. And if you think about the percolation of water below the target zone for the herbicides, so the deep percolation, that's rapid initially and then uh, shortly slows down. So it makes sense to deliver once all the water's on the field and it's settled. Uh, so typically timing that for uh, just prior to seeding when everything's wet is going to give you the most efficient delivery of your herbicide investment. And then once it's on the field, uh, keeping it there is pretty important. So locking up is critical, making sure you're not leaking water from bay to bay. And then there are mandatory withholding periods for water. Uh, for environmental purposes, they also help us because they keep our herbicides where we want them to be. So um, bear that in mind. Now, if you think about drill seeding, well, as I've pointed out, the importance of having a clean uh, seedbed, no uh, early germinating grass weeds uh, and the manner in which you pull that out uh, and rolling it if uh, you, you're using a tined implement seed drill just to give you a flatter surface. It's one that's going to lend itself to more effective use of a pre-M herbicide uh, and you'll need less water to, to flush it. Uh, one of the other um, drill seeding is if you get uh, remaining stubble from a cool burn or a wet burn or uh, remaining ash, all can tie, both, both can tie up herbicides. Uh, and so that's really an undesirable situation. Uh, something as simple as a grater board running once over that field will probably break up and bury most of that stubble. Uh, and give you a more even surface. So uh, being having your wits about you so you don't end up with targets like that because you're going to tie up a lot of the herbicide that you apply on uh, stubble that's not actually going to give you any value. So that's something to avoid. And then I pointed out earlier, uh, prior winter crop herbicide history, there are pitfalls there. We've spelt those out. So think about them. And then, of course, uh, getting an even crop stand uh, and with synchrony by flushing it quickly gives you this sort of result. That's a desirable result. Uh, and then much easier to time herbicides accordingly. Uh, in drill seeded rice, the most consistent and effective weed control we've seen over many years now is the so-called three-way mix. So one knockdown and two residual herbicides. They're overlaying alternate modes of action on barnyard grass. And together they give you a broader uh, weed spectrum of effective weed control than either of them alone. So they really are a valuable treatment. Get them on prior to the crop emergence. If the crop emerges before you get the treatment on, then think about uh, just putting uh, magister and stomp out alone and then you may need to clean them up afterwards with some ajixa or some aura but monitor those because all good things come to an end and so depending on rainfall events soil type and so forth you may have sufficient residual activity to take you through the permanent water uh, if you're going for a delayed permanent water you'll probably have to intervene a second time with herbicides and perhaps some additional stomp may go in there with either a jigsaw aura in that situation. Critical thing, of course, is to get the crop up. So early intervention, intervention there in drill seeded crops uh, means you're not chasing your tail with massive populations with post M herbicides. Uh, drift is a big issue. We've got uh, increased planting likely of uh, cotton this year, plus you've got any number of horticultural crops in various regions. So uh, having a look at the map and understanding what's downwind or potentially downwind is important in the planning stages. 
you have, can, of course, use drill seeding to avoid the need for aerial applications. Uh, the aviation industry can very efficiently deliver you floodwater treatments with the Bickley boom with minimal or no drift. But once you go at using the uh, Bickley boom, such as that with a solid stream into floodwater, um, but in, when you go to the late post treatments like the Jixa, Aura, Bassagran M60 or MCPA, they're going to have to atomize them and therefore you've got an inherent risk there. And that brings on in, new concerns regarding uh, how to deliver the treatment and not uh, clout the neighbours. So um, that decision of drill versus water seeding is going to be influenced by many aspects, uh, not just weed spectrums, but an additional one to the normal consideration is, will you have the appropriate herbicides for the field and the seeding method that you are wanting to conduct. So understanding the materials, their delivery methods, their weaknesses and their strengths is important, particularly when things get short, because we should be playing with our strengths and not battling with our weaknesses. And that may influence the sorts of programs you can or wish to apply onto a field. Uh, so understanding those things is important. These conclusions, if you want, this table can be drawn out of the Rice Crop Protection Guide, but I believe that we'll have these presentations available in some form at the Rice Extension uh, website. So I've listed those for grass in water seeded, broadleaf and sedges in water seeded, grasses in drill seeded, and further grasses in drill seeded. So that information is available to you to understand what your options are, particularly if the warehouse is empty. So it looks like a terrific prospect for a large rice crop this year. Uh, transport is disrupted worldwide, so you cannot assume that the materials you want will be available. So I think now's the time to be talking that through with your suppliers and understanding your client's needs and then start to prioritise if things are short, where you will use the available supplies because there are means by which you can stretch your suppliers. You may need to change the sowing technique and uh, work with their strengths. So for instance, as I pointed out, having a clean seed bed means that you can be a little more relaxed at sowing if you've got good water uh, coverage on your fields. The Audram label allows you to use a much lower rate at sowing in those circumstances. You can use split satin in those circumstances. You wouldn't want to use a split satin if you've got lots of barnyard grass that has survived the pre-sowing cultivations because satin is not a particularly good uh, post-emergence grass killer. It's very good as a preem. Both of them are important because they are useful in suppressing or in the case of satin controlling dirty dora right from the word go. Magister, of course, is a spectacular barnyard grass killer, uh, but it uh, offers no dirty dora control. So it's horses for courses. And by carefully picking the product to suit particular occasion, you can make your supplies go further. In the case of Taipan, we've been using that for 20 years now to uh, uh, take out the aquatic weeds. We know that with that class chemistry, if you drop your rate, it very quickly falls away in efficacy. Uh, and so even at label rate, we see Dirty Dora and sometimes staff are breaking through that treatment. There's things you can do with Taipan, get it on on time, time it when the percolation has been reduced and you're likely to get a better result with it. Uh, fortunately, we can now use with confidence Ubenic uh, at a later timing to cover those same weeds and the mixtures of Ubenic and Satin, which I think we'll be talked about shortly, 
will uh, address that particular issue that if Taipan is short, we don't need to be too concerned because we do have viable alternatives to Taipan now. So as you go to the latter timings with the post-emergence broadleaf and sedge control, Basgrand M60 and MCPA are effective. You've got to atomize them and you've got to get the water down and expose the weeds with both those. And also MCPA sodium tends to be more damaging to young rice. So they are not without their uh, challenges and they may not be your first choice in programs, but depending on product availability, you have options. Uh, have we stopped? Here we are. Sorry, I'm jumping about. So uh, for many of you, you would have come to uh, Kunamu last January and had a look at some uh, a particular trial there comparing water seed and herbicides. And one of the requirements in choosing those treatments was we were looking for treatments that don't involve atomization. So they can be delivered into flood water, typically early, and uh, across a range of species. So if you average the weed control ratings across five species there, some interesting comparisons. So uh, you'll see Audrey and Londax, which had lots of resistant weeds, wasn't performing very well. There were some survivors in Audrey and Taipan. I'll get onto those in a minute, but interestingly, the treatments that used Ubenic at the three leaf stage were spectacularly effective when in those combinations there. Now, we'll drill down a bit further than that, where we look at cumulative results. So it's the same result I've just presented, but instead of an average figure, I've given you a cumulative figure for each of the species. So uh, from left to right, uh, Echinocloa cruscali or banyo grass, Cypress deformis or Dirty Dora, Damasonia minus or star fruit, Sagittaria calcinina, which is arrowhead, and uh, Amania multiflora, which is Jerry Jerry. So you've got five, the same five weeds. You can start to see that uh, on Audram Londax, for instance, the Dirty Dora control was lousy. Uh, Starfruit was very good. Uh, Arrowhead was hopeless. If you go to the Audram Taipan treatment, it was pretty good on most, but the Amania or Jerry Jerry uh, um, grew, grew through that. Uh, similarly, with the Magister treatment, uh, the Jerry Jerry was coming through as well, uh, and some poor Dirty Dora control. Then, if you swing into um, so the, the, the dirty door control was poorer with a magister type hand than an Audram type hand. If you work across there to the middle, Audram followed by Eubenic uh, was excellent. And where you added Eubenic to that treatment, which is the fifth treatment across, you can see that it was just a little bit better. Uh, as was the Magister followed by Eubenic Satin, or indeed uh, on the right, a split Satin followed uh, with Eubenic at the second timing. So it's rather heartening that those programs that we were looking at are working very well uh, as an alternative to Audram type A. I couldn't harvest that experiment uh, because of the, the field was too wet to pull the levees down. However, I did a visual rating of their potential yield, and you can see that the uh, eubenic treatments are up there with the type N treatment. Um, somewhat poorer with the Magister type N because you don't get the suppression of Dirty Dora in that mix that you do with the Audram type N mix. So that's all good news. Uh, we pointed out that the late post treatment, so that's Aura, uh, Ajixa, uh, Basagran M60 and MCPA are all going to present you with a drift hazard. So you've got to think that one through. 
And when you lower the water, you'll get the risk of late barnyard grass germinations. Uh, Ajixa control that, plus the broadleaf, but the dora would escape from straight Ajixa. Uh, and that's why we look to materials like satin earlier or Audran to suppress or control outright the dirty dora. Uh, aura is a grass only material, but it's got a lower uh, drift hazard than Ajixa. So ultimately, you're trying to get that crop through once that's occurring, that'll suppress uh, grass weeds. And in the case of drill sown crops, as you've just seen there, the three-way mix really is essential. It just performs consistently and spectacularly well for the reasons I've just described. If you can't get on the field because of poor drainage and or rain after flushing, I still recommend you go in there with the magistrate stomp. Uh, it may not have the clout on any early barnyard grass, and there is an opportunity there. You could mix a gypsum with that treatment, but uh, more likely that you would want to delay the ajixa until uh, three leaf stage of rice. So really, the magister stomp being preems wants to go on as early as possible. That's why we recommend it goes on after the first flush, but before the crop emerges, because then you can use Dramoxone very cheaply and very effectively to take out the early weeds. We know that we can also use STEM there, but STEM is terribly expensive for that purpose. And uh, of course, you don't necessarily want to keep going to a uh, late permanent water or uh, delayed permanent water. Brian's discussed that with you in relation to uh, the phenology of the crop. And so late DPO, uh, late sown crops should not be treated with a DPW. Um, but if you go to an early permanent water, you may save herbicides because you may not necessarily need a second treatment of the field on a drill sown crop. And there's an example of a very accurately applied stuff up where the boom width was less than the swath width on the guidance system. And that shows you of a three-way mix in taking out that early barnyard grass competition. In this case, in a border chick rice crop, which probably wouldn't have done terribly well last year in cold weather, but nevertheless, it did in that particular season. So that's really what I had to cover in relation to the thinking about how we manage fields, how we choose seeding methods, or why we choose seeding methods, uh, the possibilities that we may have to change tack because of herbicide shortages, and the fact that we have good opportunities to do that. So I'd be happy to field any questions. I hope you heard what I was saying. Doesn't look like there's any questions at all, Malcolm. Thank you very much. We might um, flick over to Greg and Andrew from Corteva. They're going to give a little bit of a quick update. Oh, that's not sharing, that's good. Yep. Uh, to Greg Wells, are you up there? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Malcolm. Um, just getting, just getting the machine going. You still in lockdown up there, Greg? No, no, we aren't in lockdown, which is a good thing. Okay, is that coming through okay for everyone? Yeah, all good, Greg. All right, thank you. Uh, Charlton, just a quick process check. We're just a little bit late now. Did, did 
do, you, do I still have about 20 or should do you want me to compress it to maybe say 15 or something like that if I can? Um, if you could bring it back to about 15, that would be great. Well, I'll flip through pretty fast. Thank you. Uh, okay, so just talking about two rice herbicides, Egyxia and, and Ubenic. Um, there was good feedback last year in regards to Egyxia and Ubenic doing good weed control. Ubenic was suppressing dirty Dora and there was excellent crop safety and it seemed like similar or better than other programs in terms of safety. Uh, specifically to Egyxia, there was uh, a need or results seen where crops needed to be at least three leaf to be treated safely, um, and that's what's supported on the label. And we also had a number of, small number of off-target injury cases that were investigated, and some were regarding crops and some were regarding trees, and I'll talk more about that very shortly. So best results with the Jigsaw were achieved where the programs were used, as Malcolm's just said, um, we've seen it over and over year after year, where people follow, ideally follow the three-way program and three-way foundation in Raw seeded rice with the Jigsa, there's outstanding weed control. Um, targeting small weeds is critical. Uh, a Jigsa won't work on large weeds. Um, management is required, and we typically say one litre per hectare of any of the three crop oils. Uh, there's not much advantage to two litres per hectare, except when perhaps when you're applying by air. Um, a Jigsa is very rain fast, so uh, starting water again. Um, pretty much as soon as the field's treated is an ideal scenario, although I know that we do have two hours on the label, but that's probably a bit, a bit conservative. This is some data from the last two years, from 2019 and 20, and it's a summary of six trials. And what it's showing is the rice safety of various sequences. Um, so injuries up the left, up the y-axis, uh, and how these work is just plots of the data that we have and at the top, right across the top for each plot is the number of data points and then down the bottom is the average. So going left to right, and I should, should highlight these, probably I'll start with the blue, that's the one that we favour the most, um, we most support, that's the three-way foundation, Magisicromoxone Stomp, followed by Ajixa in the blue bar, in the dark blue bar. Very safe in the last two years to, to rice under the conditions of the trials. And then there's three other green ones, which we wanted to highlight. And, and what they're showing is that looking from the left to right, Magister plus Gramoxone, the planting followed by Jigsa is safe to rice. And then the second green arrow is Magister Gramoxone followed by Stomp plus a Jigsa, just showing that Stomp and a Jigsa is safe to rice post emergence, early post emergence at three leaf. And then over on the right hand side, if people can't get the Gramoxone on due to rain or some other complication, then Magister Stomp followed by Jigsa also is very safe to the rice as, as is the Jigsa over on the right. The next one is barnyard grass and this is really the same programs uh, in the trials over the last two years just looking at the weed control, so barnyard grass control achieved. And again just starting in the middle with the blue one, the three-way followed by Jigsa gives total weed control and that's, um, that's the one that's 24 data points, 100 100% control, excellent control. But what the graph also shows is that if you look at the ones that are highlighted by the green arrows, the foundation or the foundation treatments that vary there, starting from the left, Magister Gramoxone followed by Jigsa, then Magister Gramoxone followed by Stomp Jigsa, and then over on the right, the one that doesn't have Gramoxone, all give excellent weed control as well. So if for some reason you can't do the three way, there is a body of evidence now that shows that the sequences will still work well for weed control too. So the next section is about buffer zones and drift. And the first thing about a is that the label has these buffer zones listed on the label. And, and the first part of it is that the boom spraying and the low boom height, the buffer zones are quite short, 50 to 150 odd metres. For aerial application at the bottom, the buffer zones are three to 600 metres, as you can see there. That's the first point. Um, so in, in terms of last summer, what happened? We, we saw some uh, impact on loosen that was um, sprayed directly through um, from a neighbouring rice paddock. Uh, what, what, what was seen there was leaf crinkling cupping um, 
yellowing brown out in some leaf loss. Uh, recovery is ongoing, but generally occurred in about you know, one and a half to two months um, after the tr treatment. And where warm conditions and good soil moisture were apparent. The key point, I guess, out of this is that there were issues for neighbouring crops like Lewisham, where the buffer zones were, were observed. A downwind sensitive trees was something that we had not tested widely before we registered in Jixa. And what we've seen in the last summer is some instances of pepper, pepper trees or peppercorn trees, some folk call them. Cuba or native willow was reported to us, Acacia salicina, Bori or Mile, Acacia pendula, all having some impact or some effect from drift of the jigsaw. And again, the, the injury was roughly similar, um, some leaf cupping, twisting, process stunting, and maybe reduced growth extension in some of the trial work that we saw on some of these species. For the native willow or kuva and my or bori, the only issues reported were where the, the drift occurred within the buffer zones, in other words, inside 300 or 600 metres, and the recoveries been going, and we're continuing to, to watch those and liaise with folks. Pepper trees are a different kettle of fish, and I guess the first thing, and, and most folk on wine will know this anyway from history, but Pepper trees can react to all sorts of stresses. Um, and so there have been environmental stresses or other products that have been drifted onto them that have caused um, leaf drop or other, other symptomology. Generally, they recover with time more warmth and moisture. The thing that we found though is that winds core active appears to be highly active at um, eliciting a response in pepper trees and very low doses cause injury to the pepper trees. Um, the ones that we observed last year that were impacted are, are recovering at this point in time. These are just some pictures to give folk on the phone an idea of what sorts of symptomology you would see. So this is 28 days after uh, Malcolm sprayed a trial for us, looking specifically at pepper trees, soybeans, um, myall and, and cuba, and also she oaks, I should say. And we've just picked out the pictures here for young pepper, pepper tree seedlings. And this just shows from left to right on the left hand picture, uh, pot one is untreated, pot five, six, seven, uh, eubenic, as in rinse corrected at very low rates. And then there's barnstorm on the right. And then on the right hand picture, these are pictures of untreated on the left pot versus a jigsaw at 16, eight and four mils per hectare. And those rates were chosen due to results in previous work and also knowing what they represented in terms of the deposition curve that's used for, for uh, the drift, again, wind buffer zones that are on the label. So what do we think the key findings are from, from trees? Well, first of all, in common sense, observe the downwind buffer zones for sensitive species. Try to avoid spraying when pepper trees are downwind. And communication is really critical. So talk to the grower and talk to the, uh, any other neighbours perhaps about it. Uh, and the other comments we'd make is that trees on the paddock boundaries are most likely to be affected as they get more drifted onto them generally and that they, they do recover with, with time. Um, moving on quickly, the EJICS of best use recommendations, these are all on the label. So the label is in place. The two things I would highlight is the fourth bottom point, try to apply when the wind is blowing away from these sensitive areas or species. And then the bottom point, we would add to what's on the label somewhat and put soybean plum and peppercorns as very sensitive to drift of you know, drift of a jigsaw, so don't be aware of those in particular. Okay, jumping across to eubenic herbicide. Uh, the first thing to say is that eubenic is very good on the broadleaf aquatics. This is old data, but just re-showing it again, and it's actually strong suppression on dirty door two when the weeds are up to about two leaf in size. So the numbers on the right show the average across the number of trials in brackets. So in the case of Dirty Door, 90% odd over nine trials, water plantain, starfruit, arrowhead, and jerry jerry, um, varying numbers of trials, but still very strong control at the rate of 150 mils per hectare. <laughs> so now jumping into some work from the last couple of years. Uh, over the last two years, we've tried different sequences of eubenic with other treatments, as Malcolm alluded to earlier. 
these aren't yet on the label, so this is it for information for you all at home at this point. But what we have tried so far is things like um, satin dry soil, ordinary depleting, ordinary type in depleting, or satin, split satin, um, with eubenic, where eubenic has been applied in, applied in these sequences at the tree leaf stage. So this is the rice safety information from the from the couple of trials last year. So it's an average of two trials. On the left in the brown is satin dry soil, no injury to the rice in either trial. And then when eubenic is followed at three leaf stage, there's a little bit of injury, but it's still, still readily acceptable. Ordinary at planting, no injury uh, in the dark blue, followed by eubenic at three leaf, a little bit of injury, but readily acceptable. The light blue bars are were a surprise to us. And the only thing that we can think of was that uh, the type N sample that Malcolm used was perhaps a little bit old and perhaps may have contributed to the injury, but we, we have not seen that before and that's not consistent with results in previous years. The dark green bo uh, boxes on the right hand side are the split satin scenarios. So the first one that's no injury is just split satin. Then the second one is um, where you've been added with oil um, plus two and a half litres of satin at the three leaf rice stage. So there's a bit of injury there, but still acceptable about 15. And then a little bit more surprisingly where oil is removed from that satin plus you get it mix at three leaf stage. The comment of that for us is really just observe the safety statements and warnings that are on the satin label. In terms of weed control with these sequences, it's, um, it's been very, very compelling. So the dry soil application of satin followed by you get at three leaf is given Excellent control, or uh, and I should say this is dirty door to about one four to five weeks after the last treatment. Ordering, um, as Malcolm just said, is, is not strong on dirty door on its own. That's why the dark blue box is so widely variable. But then all the other sequences, so ordering followed by Ubenic or ordering type in followed by Ubenic, or the split satin followed by Ubenic will give excellent control of dirty door. Now the barnyard grass, really quickly. Um, all the sequences have given excellent barnyard grass control. And so that's that's quite interesting. So we can do both um, dirty door and barnyard grass control. Uh, the observations out of last year's trials, and what this is, is just trying to make comments on when to watch out, thinking that people may not have all the herbicides available that we normally have available. So when would we maybe have to think about a late season treatment based on the results of the work from the last couple of years. So for what, so for the ones that I've not shown in the previous graphs, water plantain, the satin dry soil or dream and split satin were weak. So the comment there would be when they were followed by eubenic, the control was good, but you need to time that well to make sure you're treating just seedlings. And there's been no, you know, no delay in getting to larger scopes. Jerry, Jerry, the same comments generally apply. Satin or dream or dream type in or split satin all were weakish on, uh, on Jerry, Jerry. So Tom, the eubenic treatment well. Dirty door we've done. Starfruit, uh, satin dry soil or dream or split satin were weakish. Um, and again, Tom, the eubenic to seedlings only. Barnyard grass we've done. Arrowhead, um, satin dry soil or dream or split satin were weakish. Make sure eubenic's put on the seedlings. And this is the one where I think there may be need for a post-emergence foliar treatment if something hasn't worked ideally with either the foundation or the eubenic treatment because it's the most tolerable of all the, the broadleaf aquatics out of that whole list there. Um, last slide, how to get the most out of eubenic. Uh, make sure that it follows a foundation with a different mode of action. Uh, make sure that it's put onto seedling weeds and ideally that would be at, you know about three leaf rice stage or just after the dirty door only up to two leaf and it's just suppression which is nine out of ten if those if the weeds are at that stage the aquatics is a bit more flexible the broadleaf aquatics is a bit more flexibility up to four leaf and about five centimeters um, always pre-mix in oil and try to manage the water to so that there's um, still only slightly salt moving water for the five days after treatment and uh, that's me done Unless there's any questions. All done in 15, um, Charlie. Thanks, Greg. No, it was very good. Um, if anyone's got any questions, please just put them in the chat or else feel free to email Greg or Andrew. Just quickly before we move on, um, we do have Paul and Paul online from Field Air. Um, 
do either of you guys want to make a comment, I guess, around um, this season upcoming chemical application from the plane? Yeah, here you go. Good, thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, yeah, other Paul had to jump out for a minute. Um, so he's left it up to me, I suppose. Um, pretty well much the biggest problem we've got with um, around the oh, sort of deniliquin and that is the um, what the the cotton, the hemp, um, any of the really susceptible crops um, are playing a big part with what we've what the agronomists have got to use um, to start with, um, which is going to be a bit of a nightmare this year with the shortage of chemical. Um, but it's just, I suppose it's come back to the point where, you know, some of the, the farms themselves actually need to um, do a better plan. Like, you know, with predominantly a southwesterly wind, um, you don't put a susceptible crop up on the northeast corner. So like, just little things like that that farmers should be aware of, but they, year after year, they don't. They just keep on doing it and then um, it's sort of one of those things you just got to keep on waiting and waiting and waiting for the wind and the farmers get more and more aggravated because we can't do it um, and yeah it's a little bit of a pain in the backside. Um, one thing that uh, for me is the RGA have they done anything with the um, uh, the mapping side of uh, where the rice crops are going to be. Can someone answer that one? That'd be Sunrise, it would be yeah. RGA, but that'd be oh, Sunrise. Mark or Anna. Might be able to might be able to add some comment. So I guess just on that point, so this, there is a SATA map, but um, the last I heard it is getting a big uptake either. So I think it was something like only 40% of cotton crops are put on it. So it's very challenging, um, but yeah, certainly a pertinent point. Yeah, it is. Paul, and and we've, we, um, we actually don't know where individual paddocks are until seed is ordered. Um, but as soon as that seed, do, so growers to order seed have to actually put it into a paddock within the GLS. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we like to think that's relatively accurate. We do check it later on the season using imagery, but um, um, yeah, yeah. So until the seed orders are in, we don't know which paddock is in, but once the seed orders are in, which in this case uh, opens up early, you know, early September, um, we, uh, yeah, we have it then. And we can certainly supply you with a, a shape file or, or um something with that if that's yeah if that'd, that'd be great mark yeah. just um one thing i know around sort of this area in like denny that obviously there is a fair few seed crops it would be lovely to know that which are seed crops and what variety they are um you know and flags to be out sort of and i've been built my head against brick wall for years that first of october that the flags are out ready to go so at least we know um, especially with the later varieties now, um, well, we don't know if we're flying over because they've still got sheep in the paddock before they yeah, actually, yeah. which makes it very, and then, because we get the phone call from the farmer, abusing the absolute crap out of us because we're flying over a, a um, you know, a seed block. So, yeah, yeah. like, you know, if these seed growers are fed income, they should be organised before, the, like, 1st of October, ready to go. And yeah, they should nah. know what paddocks they're doing. Uh, yep, excellent. Good feedback, and we'll get onto that as soon as we can. And uh, and good to hear that you actually do take notice of flags because growers sort of feel they're a bit outdated and it's just a thing of the past. But um, but uh, yeah, obviously they you're still taking notice of them. Well, the other thing, Mark, is they've got to take the flags down from last year. <laughs> yeah, fair point. <laughs> fair point. So anyone who's listening to that who, uh, who did have seed growers last year, just um, I will be in touch with seed growers fairly regularly, but but uh, yeah, do let them know that. Yeah, because oh. like every time, every year that I've um, done it, is that the seed growers can't pick up their flags until 
if I pick up a sleeve. Yeah, yeah. Charlton, can I make a point in regard to uh, issues there with drift? Yep. Um, my understanding is that uh, although the Saturn Eubenic combinations are not yet on the label, I would understand that they are still, it is still legal for those mixtures to be applied uh, and they enable you to deliver those treatments through Bickley Boom without the inherent uh, drift risk associated with MCPA or Asagran M60 and much easier from a grower's perspective on in terms of water management. So uh, a little bit more emphasis on thinking ahead there would enable the aerial operators to stick to Bickley boom applications uh, and much less risk of drift hazards from the other products. Greg, is, is that a correct interpretation of the laws in relation to labels, that you can do a mixture of eubenic and satin under the current situation? Yeah, thanks, Malcolm. I, I had not thought that through deeply before the meeting, and I just need to go and see what the state control of this legislation says and report back, um, and I'll do that via or your child and or, or, the, or the team, if that's okay. Um, I think it's okay, but I'll just, just go away and confirm that and report that. Yeah, my, my interpretation was that you're not permitted to promote it if it's not on your label, but the mixing of products, provided they stay within the label guidelines, is permitted. But I haven't read any legislation for about 20 years, so perhaps I'm not the person to make the call. All right, thanks everybody. Um, just quickly, David Trolldale, would you like to jump in and update everybody about the resources that are available? And then we'll hand over to Grower Services team of Mark and Anna. Yep, no worries. Um, so very quickly, um, to keep you on time, um, Brian's mentioned the rice variety guides. Um, we will try and have a hard copy of those in all in one booklet. Um, certainly in the next, uh, before the end of September. Um, the rice growing guide has been redone and thanks to all those who um, were involved in that. Um, so it's just been updated. We didn't, hadn't done one since 2018, I believe. Um, so we will, that's just going through the designer um, at the moment, so we'll be printed hopefully around about the same time. Um, crop protection guide is, is at a bit of a, um, I'm, I'm having trouble with a, getting a designer and editor with that, but we'll hopefully get that done by the end of September as well. Um, I guess that new things is we've, as, as Greg alluded to, uh, we're actually moving the Ajixa to the three leaf stage. It was uh, earlier, I believe. Um, so that'll be a change. Um, we have uh, permits for fall armyworm and locusts um, in there. Uh, so they're, they're uh, noted in there. Um, for a future, I guess, um, the modes of actions are going to change from alphabetical to numerical. And I'm pretty sure that's uh, 2024 that that becomes legislative. Uh, le legislative. Um, so I guess that's just a heads up for everyone knowing um, uh, that that's coming. Um, talked about off target damage, basically follow the label. Um, so I guess on, on that note, APVMA uh, have a spray drift pilot program happening at the moment with a spray drift management tool. So I'll keep a bit of an eye on that and, and let you know how that goes. Also with the APVMA, the Molinate review is nearing completion, well, has been completed. We've had some conversations with them and I think it'll be publicized fairly soon. Um, 
I guess a question for all the uh, agronomists and any new agronomists, uh, that weed ID ute guide that we put out, um, do you like it uh, and would you like more printed? And that's about it from me. Perfect. Thanks, David. Um, has anyone got any questions around accessing any of those resources? I've just put the link in the chat to find the growing guides. Brian has done a VO71 growing guide, so I recommend that you download it if you do have growers who are lucky enough to get seed. Alrighty, I'm going to hand over to Mark and Anna, um, and they're going to do a quick grower services update. Thanks, Charlton. Um... Can see the screen there. Yeah, all good. Okay, you've got it in um, full screen mode. Not on mic. No, not yet. Gina. Yeah. Sorry about this. Yeah, no, it's still not full screen, but I think you, it'll be right, Anna. I think we can all see it. Yeah, I know. Okay, we'll roll with this. Um, firstly, I just wanted to congratulate those who got fantastic results last year in the most challenging of seasons. I mean, there were a good number of roses amongst the thorns in a season that, um, yeah, wanted want to put behind themselves. Um, plenty to learn and take take into this season, though, particularly on how important it is following the key steps um, to get the best results. Um, and both Rice Extension, Mark, and I have been really encouraged by the um, amount of one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one interactions we've been having with um, the agronomists across the valley. And we look forward to building on those connections throughout this uh, season ahead. Um, I guess our role, Marks and I, today is to update you on um, the latest communications that have been coming out of Sunrise, um, to give you all the relevant information where we can. Um, and please, if you want any more details on anything we um, discussed today, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Um, we're aiming for, to provide you, the agronomists, with the most up-to-date information at the same time as the growers, um, so you're armed with the most um, relevant resources at the times when you're talking to them. Um, so as you'll be aware, this week we announced um, fixed price tonnage contracts for Rizik and VN, oh, sorry, Rizik and VO71 at $400 a tonne. Um, contracting today, open today for critical year growers, which this season are the C20 growers. Critical year growers um, get priority access to um, contracts and seed orders for two years post their critical year. So um, last year it was C19 and C20 growers. This year it's just the C20 growers. And next year we'll just roll back to being um, everyone on the same level playing field and access at the same time as the two years will have expired for the C20 growers. Um, and this Friday, all growers will have access to these fixed tonnage contracts um, that are open at the moment. There is a tonnage limit set for these contracts. And once that volume is reached um, at any stage, the contracts will be closed. Um, and then at that point, the pool will be available um, at a later date in September. Um, these fixed tonnages, fixed contracts are um, 
tonnage based, obviously not hectare based, and the um, there's only like a tolerance of uh, 12 tonnes or 5%, whichever is the lesser on those contracts. Um, the varieties and the premiums for the pool were also announced this week. And um, yeah, I expect that to be open in about the second week of September. Notably, Sherpa has been um, admitted from the variety mix for this season um, at this stage. VO71 has been pitched as the cold tolerant replacement variety um, as it has greater market acceptance than Sherpa. I mean, one of VO71's strengths is that can it, be, it can be commingled with um, Rizik and Viand um, at the depot, creating more, more options there and, and single, shed, single variety sheds, um, which are more efficient. So at this stage, the range of varieties offered um, in the pool reflect the highest returning markets that, and the best options for maximising pool returns that the company believes they can get. Um, I've also fielded a few inquiries from growers um, regarding what options they have for planting rice on rice on their Sherpa stubbles from last season. Um, and the best advice we can give at this stage is um, make sure that you get a really hot burn and good cultivation on those paddocks if you're um, aerial sowing and just try and bury any of those remaining seeds as deep as possible if, if there are any survivors. Um, so just do everything as, as possible to reduce the risk. Um, they can grow a medium grain variety, so Rizik, VO71 or Vian with um, no penalty. Um, or they could choose to grow opus, but, um, but the risk is exceeding the tolerance level of a, a medium grain contaminant and getting um, down, downgraded or um, discounted down to the medium grain price on that opus crop. Um, you'll also know opus is back in the mix for the pool in a small volume this season. Um, the delivery plant for Opus and Koshi will both be Denny, so keep that in mind if you've got growers on the far western or eastern edges of the valley that are considering growing um, those varieties. So Denny will be their delivery plant, whereas um, the medium grains can go Moulamine, Baraboy, Denny and, and Finley at this stage, most likely. Um, seed is expected to be available from AGS, um, in late September and for medium grains should be priced around $630, $650 a tonne depending on um, collection point. I guess just on the market front, um, there's lots of opportunities presenting in the international markets at the moment. Um, California had about a 15% reduction in um, average plantings this year due to low water availability. And our medium grain markets have also been performing really well internationally. Uh, short grains, however, have been significantly impacted by COVID with reduced demand from food service industry. Um, so from a sunrise point of view too, with no, non-supply in 2019 and 2020, um, due to the drought, we did lose some ground in those areas, but demand may pick up domestically in the food services area um, as we get through the pandemic, hopefully. Carrot C is also the big unknown and who knows where it will be in um, 18 months time when we start you know, marketing and selling, selling this crop we're planning. Um, but if the dollar hovers around 72 cents, rather than 82 cents, it'll be um, much more favorable and could be the difference in $100 to $150 a tonne in um, paddy price. Shipping has also been a huge challenge um, internationally. So the supply and availability of containers in key ports around the world has meant um, container freight has gone from about 500 bucks a container to $5,000 a container. Um, worldwide shipping is also dealing with the backlog from the Suez Canal traffic jam earlier in the year. And um, yeah, domestically though, our market remains pretty strong. About 400,000 tonnes um, gets consumed, a finished product gets consumed in there every year. So of which Sunrise has about a, a 50, 60% um, 
or is a 50, 60% player in? So plenty of options um, in the near future. Um, we've covered a lot on the agronomics of VO71, so I won't repeat any of that, but I'm really pleased that we're offering this um, variety on a large scale this season. We have about enough seed for around about 20,000 hectares, and you will need to be aware that the sowing rate for this variety will be limited to 130 kilos per hectare. Um, BO71 has performed particularly well in the Murray Valley under a number of conditions, and each of these crops um, listed in the table was sown alongside an adjacent Rizik crop that was under the same management and um, sown at the same time uh, last season. Um, some of the Rizik crops, however, were harvested about two to three weeks uh, behind the VO71 crops. Um, that were planted at the same time. Um, and the superior cold tolerance to Rizik was um, very evident last season in the VO71 crops. Certainly the aim of 71 is to provide a bold medium grain that will power through the cold, has wide market acceptance. And um, I think this looks really, really promising for meeting all those criteria. There's also been a few questions regarding um, the comparison of VO71 to um, Sherpa in the Murray. And from what I saw last year, VO71 does have the potential to outyield um, Sherpa. Um, in the Murray, Eastern Murray Valley, I outperformed Sherpa by about um, one tonne, and in the West by 2.4 tonnes per hectare. Who knows though, if this year's far more normal in regards to climate. Um, we may see that yield gap narrow in a little bit, um, but all indicators are, are quite positive for you know, the performance of VO71 and its suitability to be a replacement for Sherpa um, in the near future. Again, the ever popular Grow Rice um, input funding facility is available for all growers. Um, so it's currently open at the moment for um, water inputs for rice crops and then post crop establishment and post a crop inspection, um, it's available for all other crop inputs for growers. Um, C20 growers have access to $2,000 a hectare as they're the critical year growers and all other growers have access to $1,500 a hectare for crop inputs. Um, worth noting too, the vendors paid on invoicing of accounts. So um, the accounts aren't carried forward on, on the book um, for the duration of the season. Um, and invoices are generally paid within three days directly back to the vendor or, or to the grower to pay the vendor. Um, yeah, so it's been quite an efficient and um, good system that's, yeah, thankfully back in this year. I know there's a comment on the chat that says uh, it's around um, VO71 replacing Sherpa. It says growers need a later sowing option. I feel it's unreasonable on growers to get all their rice sown over a three week period. It would cap growers out at 600 to 700 acres in my opinion. Growers don't like VN. We really need Sherpa. Any comments or to add to that? Yeah, I understand Adam. Um... Look, at this stage, though, the best alter like the best range or, or mix in varieties that um, the board's decided to announce is emitting Sherpa from that mix. So, yeah, it does really only leave um, the end as the late sowing option, um, despite its um, issues with cold. Um, Sherpa, though, I guess really only extends the Rizik window by, or the VO71 window by a week. Um, yeah, whereas Viand will extend that window by three weeks. So, yeah, that's probably the best. Yeah, I can I just add to that, and um, you're right. It, it's and Brian might want to jump in. There is only a five-day sort of increase in the sowing window. I know it's a popular late sowing variety. 
Late Razik didn't perform well last year either. Um, and the early Razik performed, uh, sorry, Sherpa didn't perform well either. Um, so, you know, the late crops uh, were no, you know, just didn't perform full stop last year. Um, there was some really good viand last year, and I, I'm not going to sugarcoat one versus the other. Razik's an excellent, sorry, Sherpa is an excellent agronomic variety. We just can't get the value for it in the marketplace, basically. So, whereas Viand, VR71 and Razik, we can. And um, um, I think we do have to, or we, we've, you know, learned to grow Viand a lot more than we did. We, we went in fairly blind earlier on. Um, when it first came and tried to grow it like Sherpa and it, it uh, well, both Sherpa and Razik and didn't uh, perform that well. Um, there were some excellent results of the end last year in all valleys. And um, uh, and it's certainly, you know, you've got to, as Anna said, another few weeks on the window rather than a few days. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's just, that's, that's uh, where we're at with it. Um, Sherpa's a bit of a moving feast. Uh, and continues to, continues to be, and um, uh, and yeah, unfortunately, we'll potentially have this discussion again. I think, um, Mark, if I just add a couple of comments, I think I totally agree. Um, I think the opportunity is there to use different sowing methods to try and spread the windows a bit, um, particularly, you know, sowing earlier if you can drill sow and then use the aerial sowing for later. And I think. The end does have a role. I think you really should target a yield of like 10 to 11 tonne. You don't want to overdo it and be targeting the sort of yield you'd get out of um, Rizik and, um, or Sherpa because you'll probably come unstuck. Yeah. Thanks, Mark and Brian. Thank you. Um, Girl Portal, all contracts, um, are available available through the grower portal this season or you can call grower services um, like we said contracts open today for um, c20 growers and will open this friday to all growers um, they're just available nine to five business days um, through those platforms um, We'll mention to Matt Rice is where we'll be collecting all critical seasonal um, notes and dates for predictive analysis again this year. And yes, it may not be the most attractive platform to use, but it's where information is best stored so that we can provide back to you, um, you and the growers, uh, evidence-based predictions that will help you make proactive decisions around um, crop management. So again, yeah, we will be using that platform. Um, just to make a note though, to make sure paddocks are mapped correctly in the GIS or the map rice prior to um, ordering seed, it makes the whole process much, much easier if um, paddocks are correctly mapped. Um, and agronomists can have access to map rice to their growers' accounts. Um, by getting the grower to simply log in and select the farms that they wish to give you access to. And if anyone needs any help with that, just feel free to um, reach out to Mike or I. Uh, whole grain yield results were sent out to growers last week. And over the result, overall, the results have been um, fantastic from last season. Uh, the long dry Long drawn out dry down period, which delayed harvest, um, definitely attributed to these great results. Of particular note, the um, Koshikari results are outstanding. Not often do you see an average of 72%, but a high of 73.5% is um, pretty exceptional. Um, and the medium grain results have been um, also really pre pleasing, which will just create greater efficiencies through the mill. Um, and additional tonnage, tonnages of finished product to, um, to market versus budget. So that's been an overall um, good result. Paddy Vision as well um, is a new uh, process in place for providing real-time um, real feedback on whole grain yield results. So um, it was trialled at AGS last season. Um, it was developed by Mark Talbot, who works at um, 
Sunrise and has got a very, very good background in all of this um, grain quality stuff. So what it basically is, is the ability for whole grain results to be made available at the sample stand. Last year it was trialled over um, 14,000 loads, which were analysed at the sample stand. Um, so the unmilled paddy is placed on the tray and light at varying angles is um, shone through the um, paddy to determine if there's any cracks, um, single, double or um, broken grains amongst the paddy. Um, and then it's run through a model to provide a whole grain yield analysis result. I guess the aim of this eventually is to provide real-time feedback to growers regarding whole grain, um, rather than waiting several months for appraisal results to come through. And for AGS to manage or segregate according to quality based on a load by load basis. Um, so yeah, that's just something coming through in the pipeline. I guess just to finish, um, please feel free to reach out to Mark um, and I or Rice Extension if anyone wants any further information regarding um, anything we've touched on today. Like I said, we've really enjoyed working um, alongside Rice Extension and all the agronomists and look forward to um, building on these relationships again throughout the season. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Alrighty. Um, quickly, we are a little bit over time, so I will try and make this as quick as possible. Um, so as you would have just heard, this year Rice Extension and Soil Services did a bit of a comparison of VR71 and Resix. So really quickly, just wanted to share, here's a bit of an overview of comparison crops at Moolamine. So this was um, aerial zone, uh, Resic and a VO71 was dry broadcast. Um, I guess the takeaways from this from the grower were that VO71 was five to seven days quicker in the establishment up front and it wasn't pre germinated. Um, they really noticed that kind of from PI onwards, the VO71 crop continued to grow and the Resic kind of became stagnant and was stationary. And then this really came became evident. I guess at time of draining, the VO71 crop was drained about a week before the resic, and there was a month's difference between harvesting the two crops. So overall, I just wanted to provide a bit of a snapshot. Um, you know, this is a very traditional aerial zone crop and management, but it worked really well for this grower. Also in the Murray Valley, we had this um, comparison to crops at Daniliquin. They were grown in direct drill. Um, Management was very similar um, in both paddocks, sown, you know, about a week apart and harvested very similar dates. Um, the only thing this grower did find, you can see in the top uh, right corner, there's a picture there. This grower did use a mixture of gramoxone and propanil and there's just a little bit of propanil damage and gramoxone damage as well. So. Just making sure, I guess, for anyone who's growing seed that your timing is correct. Um, the other thing is this grower was really good with their agronomist and they used imagery looking at when to apply fertilizer and also doing a split at PI. Um, their harvesting dates, they were about two and a half weeks apart. So I guess the, the key critical things that we learned from the growers is that the 71 its maturity wasn't delayed because of the cold weather, which meant PI was at the right time, flowering was in that window that Brian mentioned earlier, and also the microspore was at the correct timing. And the yield definitely worked in these growers' favours. So Rice Extension is bringing out a case study, which is just kind of around that grower management for this season. It'll be up on our website in the next few weeks for everybody to have a look at. So. If you do have someone who's thinking about growing VR71, definitely from growers, their, I guess, experience from this year was that it was very worthwhile them growing it. Um, is there any questions around the VO71? Alrighty, I'll just hand over to Troy. He's just going to chat quickly about water use in the MAL footprint. 
Yeah, thanks, Charlie. So obviously last season, uh, water use in the Murray Valley was uh, very high. There's lots of discussions and reasons why. And so in discussions with uh, Penny Sloan from MIL, um, she sent along this bit of information, which I think was is handy as a table to explain why um, uh, part of the reason why our water use is up. So if we look at the graph, we can see back in August 06, there was about 283,000 hectares that had a water table of two to four metres. And then as the millennium drought went on, we can see that deteriorate, it got less and less that area with the, with the water table of two to four metres. We can see that it's slowly um, grown up to August 2017 and, and that was 1617, remember very wet year. So it built then and then it's dropped off again. So I guess I, I just present this as, so if you're talking to your um, growers, I guess it's an awareness that uh, you're probably not going to use as much water as, uh, you're probably going to use more water than what you uh, historically have. This is one of the reasons why, uh, whether it's got to do with flume gates or, or inlets or outlets, that's another discussion. But I just think this is um, yeah, pretty important to share to show that what's happening um, under the soils, under our, uh, what, yeah, with our water depths. So it is have, having an impact. So when you're doing your budgets, water budgets, I think you need to take, it, take into account um, what's happening below us. So. Um, and the other thing, so water use uh, from MIL this year was 14.9 megalitres per hectare average. So that was derived by getting a shape file from Sunrise uh, Grower Services with all the um, paddock sown and overlaying it uh, onto the MIL map. And that's how it's derived. So I think it's in, an important figure as well. Just once again, if you're talking to your clients to have a realistic um, uh, water budget for your cropping. So obviously this year it's been uh, wetter, we've got more soil moisture. Um, we've had an irrigation season last year, so I wouldn't expect it to be as bad at, or as high as last year, but yeah, so just thought I'd share that with you. Thanks, Charlie. Oh, there's one more slide. Thanks. Yeah, hang on. Thanks, Troy. Uh, sorry, oh, sorry guys. Um, just quickly, here's a bit of an overview of what rice extension is going to do for this season. So we're going to hold our grower groups again. There'll be our generic field walks around key timings in which we'll invite Brian and Malcolm to come and present. Um, as Mark and Anna have said, really encourage the informal catch-ups that we had with agronomists last season. It was really good, I know, for myself and Troy to sit down with our growers and see what what you guys are seeing in paddock and what we're hearing as well. Also the collection of key steps data, we will be working with grower services to put that into the GIS system. So when you guys are catching up with growers, you know, if they're using that um, platform or if you're collecting that data for them, if you guys could encourage them to put it into GIS, that would be great. And just finally, um, I'm finishing up with RAS extension at the end of August. So moving forward for all the agronomists and chemical companies, Troy will be the major contact for the Murray Valley. So if you don't have his um, email address or phone number, I will be sending that around for everybody so they can stay in contact with him. Um,